Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, thank you to the <coughs> organizers for uh, inviting me. Uh, I must admit, I came to this forum with 38 slides. And as I heard the speakers, I kept deleting the repetition. So with the time, I think it's good that I just have 13 slides left now. So I have tried to weed out all the repetitions that were there. And I thought that uh, I should probably then focus on the human rights and the political science aspect of uh, evidentiary value and how it is very, very important for us to intersect law, psychology, justice mechanisms, political science, criminology, all together to be able to dole out what we want to dole out, that is justice. So uh, with that emphasis, I'll just share my slides and I really, really hope I've managed to weed out. Uh, can you see the slide? Yes, ma'am, it's clearly visible. Can you uh, turn this into screen show? Yes, it's perfect. Yeah, yeah. so Thank I'll begin. <clears throat> I'll begin by saying that uh, I don't think so. There is any uh, you know, difference in the aim and the goal that all of us are sitting uh, or aiming at, uh, whichever profession we come from, and that is getting to the truth and getting to deliver justice to the victim or the survivor of whichever evidence, uh, whichever crime we are talking about. However, when we're talking about forensic evidence, there has been a whole lot of debate. These are just a few news clips that you can see from 2008, from 2004 to today. There are a whole lot of debates that happen in the court of law. And the role of the media in polarizing the <clears throat> general population towards acceptance and not acceptance. So you can see during the Telgi scam, during uh, Arushi mother case, and even during the enforcement of public opinion in the Shushan Singh Rajput's case, there has been a whole lot of polarization that happens that kind of puts pressure on both the criminal justice as well as the scientific community. Now, we as people who are engaging with the justice mechanism, it's very important to understand no matter what is the pressure that is being uh, implicated upon us, it's important to stand by the words of justice or by the aims of justice. So, <clears throat> The role of media is something I think that we need, really need to question. And uh, uh, the basic questions when we talk about forensic uh, evidence is that how do we contemplate and elucidate the term justice in CGS, that is criminal justice system? What is the focus of the state when we talk about internal security? Because that is where I believe yesterday there were a whole lot of de deliberations that uh, Policing does not have freedom. Policing is under political pressure. And other uh, adjoining justice mechanisms also function under a whole lot of limitations. And that limitation is attuned to the um, internal security perception, conception by the state mechanism. So if we compare external security and internal security, there is a whole lot of mismatch. And there cannot be this dichotomy between internal security. Because ultimately, today we are seeing that internal security is getting the due attention for all the wrong reasons. Had we paid this attention, we would not have been here where we are today. And finally, one very important question that is there is that what propels the decisions in the justice mechanism? And that is where the previous two speakers have talked about that it is about evidence and it is not about judgment. It is very, very important to be focused on that. And it is because of the first three questions that there has been an over-reliance as well as reliance. I'm using both the words with a whole lot of uh, uh, conceptions because over-reliance is very bad. Reliance is a good option. That why are we using deception detection tests, <clears throat> which is basically uh, polygraph, narcoanalysis, and brain mapping in, in a pursuit of justice. And uh, these are the questions that we criminologists are engaging with and attempting to uh, underscore the fact that one is not against delivering justice, but one is against uh, aligning to injustice to deliver justice. And that is something that we should be deliberating upon. So <clears throat> narcoanalysis, as the previous two speakers have already said, it, it requires uh, injecting uh, certain drugs into the body of the person whom we are uh, 
who is under scrutiny. And uh, these uh, injectables are the point of discourse or debate by various human rights activists, as well as a whole lot of justice uh, uh, <clears throat> mechanisms across the world, because it actually induces a state of anesthesia and a state of delirium in the mind of the person. And what they say during that time and what they share during that time is not under their control. So. <clears throat> to make a person less inhibited, to be able to divulge something. And the state is known as a semi-conscious state. So is that admissible? Is that not admissible? And that is what the previous two speakers have absolutely underlined correctly, that it is not admissible completely. It can be corroborated. But the main drawback of this uh, evidence uh, that we get out of this test of narcoanalysis is that there are a whole lot of people, and that psychology is also attested to, that the mental frame or the mental make of each individual is different. And each individual will differently endure these tests. So someone who comes from a strength of mental makeup or who has been attuned to, you know, someone who does meditation, someone who has been doing a whole lot of mind exercises, for them, narcoanalysis may not turn out to be the one tool which will help in getting out the truth or elucidate the truth or be able to get into the unconscious of the person. Whereas some people are more fragile. They will be able to come out much easily. And this is something that many people have attested to forensic uh, uh, people have attested that there's some people who take a lot of time to break up. And there's some people who immediately start spewing out a whole lot of information. And out of that whole lot of information, they have to kind of get out the fact that what is uh, uh, what is admissible, what is critical, and what is probably just a whole lot of extra information. But however, whatever is being shared under the influence of this drug, is it the truth or is it not the truth? Now, that is something that one cannot tell you scientifically through these tests. So we uh, these tests basically get out a whole lot of information, and this information needs to be interpreted, needs to be corroborated with a whole lot of evidence, and that will then finally lead to the fact that how does the judgment get influenced or not influenced by this. Now, uh, the problem here is that the, the adoption of these technologies here, uh, though I'm specifically talking about truth serum, serum these technologies have been embroiled in a whole lot of legal and scientific uh, opaqueness. That is, one is not very, very clear about what is the legal sanctity. There are a whole lot of legal uh, judgments. Should you use? How should you use? What are the basic limitations? What are the rights that have to be maintained, et cetera, et cetera. But what is it that the legal quantum or the legal justice philosophy is looking for has not been very well specified in either of the countries. It just says that it is something that will lead to, uh, lead to uh, expulsion of truth from the person who is embedding it or is holding on to it. The scientific validity is also embroiled. There are many, many studies, many journals have attested to the fact that one does not attest to the truth truth serum uh, admissibility and the fact that this works as the way the legal mechanism wants it to be. <clears throat> So one book that I recently read, The Truth Machines by Jeannie Lok uh, Lokanita, she very, very clearly uh, documents the fact that this uh, uh, reliance on these various forensic evidence has shown a lot of hastiness in the Indian judicial system or in the Indian criminal justice system. And where is the regulatory mechanisms related to these uh, scientific methods is something that she's questioning very, very strongly in her book. So, one of the reasons that uh, we see uh, across various papers and across various judgments is that when these tools came into India, our human rights standards were very, very weak. And if you can see, it is those human rights standards that propelled the low human rights standards, so to say, propelled the establishment of the National Human Rights Commission as well in India. And that is why we had in 1993, because we were under a whole lot of scrutiny, that the human rights records of India, especially within the CGS, was very, very weak. So our human, uh, human rights standards, the fact that tortures was uh, unabated in our system. So one needed to question that. And the physical brutality, the number of torturous uh, deaths uh, in custody had really, really exceeded. Now, all of these three points led to the fact that we need something so that we can address all of these together and have something that would transform the criminal justice system. Now, 
the question that we ask today as criminologists or as justice uh, professionals is that have we been able to address this? Have these uh, forensic uh, tools been able to help us address this? The courts in the same line were also wanting to uh, uh, accept certain techniques and technologies that would take us away from the colonial structure of custody and uh, torture. And that is where they talked about that let's get more scientific, let's get more technologically aligned, let's do it in a manner which would be acceptable and we would be able to deliver justice fast. <clears throat> But the fact remains that a whole lot of evidence had started emerging that forensic psychologists were complicit in the uh, new forms of torture that emerged with the use of these technologies. Now, the very fact that you wanted to weed out torture by using these technologies, you are shifting the phase focus from physical torture to something that was very subtle torture. And that subtle torture then started escalating because there was a whole lot of pressure that you have to get out the truth, you have to get the person to admission, admit to what they have done. So the very fact that uh, the uh, rationale to align ourselves to these technologies was to address the problem of torture, the same did not get addressed in the narcotic uh, serum. Another huge issue here is that uh, though psychology does align itself to understanding human behavior, detailing human mechanisms as to how you respond to a certain uh, stimuli, there is a whole lot of scientific studies saying that in condition A, a person would behave like this. However, there is always a rider under our psychological trials, treatment studies saying that a person, a human mind cannot be said to be uh, responding to the same stimuli in a similar way. So if there is an exception to that, then how do you deal with it? If there is another methodology, because there are a whole lot of um, cultural differences, there are a whole lot of uh, individual differences that people align to when they respond to a certain questioning. So for example, if I am being questioned by a police officer, since I work with police, I will not find it very intimidating. I would be able to respond in a very different fashion. However, the same person, another person who's never met the police, but has got a conception about the police officers, they will behave in a very different fashion. So these nuances, these differences have to be uh, understood have to be collated, they have to be scientifically approved by studies done in India exclusively. We have to have these uh, understandings very clearly uh, uh, put into a, a very, very clean document where the ethical guidelines would be resorted to. Now, putting all of this together comes the larger framework or the larger environment in which we exist. And that is the capitalist framework where you have all the business houses who aim to push their uh, products to the Indian state. Now here the Indian state does not mean just the whole idea of India. In the Indian state, there are a whole lot of individuals. So there are a whole lot of police officers, there are a whole lot of justice mechanisms, justice personnel who seem to get aligned to these interests because they want to propel justice in India. Now what happens is these interests, these commercial interests may not be sharing the complete truth. So when they are advertising or when they are selling their products, they may be telling us that this is what the product aims to. There is not going to be any side effect of this product. This product in so-and-so condition may not perform, etc. These are all small riders that we all never read when we either sign into a new website or when we are signing a small insurance document. So all of these riders that are there in the usage of these technologies needs to be uh, very well uh, spelt out and has to be first spelt out before you even start uh, advertising for your product. Now this has come into play very, very importantly in the use of artificial intelligence. So one speaker before me was talking about uh, footprints of technology. Now the footprints of technology in today's world can be hacked into. There is a possibility you have numerous hackers who are into the criminal uh, into the criminal uh, context who aim, who select their <clears throat> victim, obviously these are mostly high profile victims, but however, uh, in the due course, uh, in the given uh, changing uh, environment, maybe it would come down to even uh, other uh, 
victims. So what they do is they hack into the systems in a manner where they can show that the victim was at another place at another time. There are evidences where they are saying that Fitbit can also be hacked into to show that the person was probably engaging in another activity when they were not. So the problem here uh, is that by the time the state is aligning itself to a given technology, the hackers and the others have probably moved 10 steps ahead. So to keep track of that becomes a huge responsibility. It involves a whole lot of huge investment. It does not, uh, it should not be the way it has been till today. Our response or the state's response has been very, very uh, uh, non contiguous. It has been, there is a problem, let's address it. Now we have to be very, very clearly uh, aware that there has to be a consistent allocation of funds for both staff and technology to be upgraded in the justice mechanism. So that uh, uh, the previous speakers have already talked about the fact that there are guide, uh, the, the judgments that have talked about the fact that forcible ad, uh, administration of these methods or uh, submitting a person to a certain test without his or her knowledge is violation. And this right against self-incrimination that is enumerated in the constitution needs to be understood in its entirety. The very fact that a justice professional feels that this person must have committed the crime does not give them the right or the uh, power to administer that test over the person. So a whole lot of um, there's a whole lot of nuances of rights and uh, political agency of a person, whether the person is a, a person who is under scrutiny or whether the person is um, the person who is administrating the test. So narco analysis without consent is not admissible, is not allowed, and uh, one has to be very, very clear about it, and especially narco analysis because it involves injecting of a uh, drug in your body. And in even in medical procedures, when I go to a doctor for a certain procedure, the doctor has to inform me that what is the treatment, what is being given to me, and what are going to be the counter uh, indications of a certain drug. And that is where the doctor will ask you that, do you have ABC condition? Because this drug may aggravate that condition. However, when narco analysis initially in the 2004 to the 2012 phase, when it was being conducted, there were no ethical guidelines. It was just being done. It was uh, to with the express intent of getting the truth out of the person who was incriminated in a certain uh, crime. So uh, this also brings in a whole lot of questions regarding medical ethics, because as we said, these, this is a collusion or coming together of various professions. So all the professionals met, uh, ethics, that is the legal ethics, medical ethics, jurisprudence ethics, all of these have to collude. They have to come together. We cannot give up one ethic in uh, the against the interest of the others. So some guideline that will get all of these three together to be able to say that to improve justice outcomes, we need these technologies, but we will align to all of these ethics or protocols that have been brought out. And if these protocols are not adhered to, there will be strict action taken, uh, taken against the team that is administering or the individual that is administrating or the person who's colluded to, uh, to go against the enrolled ethical standards. Now, to be able to maintain these ethical standards, it's very, very important that um, we have a multidisciplinary team which is absent in our criminal justice system. At the very onset, at the very beginning, at the police station, there is a need to have, as I heard uh, Ma'am Shubhra Sanyal say, that we need forensic scientists or investigators and psychologists and social workers at the police station level. We often tend to lump in the police, saying that they are not being able to adhere to the investigative requirements. But one should understand we work at the police station and at any given point of time when there is a high case load, the police, uh, the station house is dealing with at least minimum 40 different kinds of uh, crimes. That is something as simple as a stolen uh, footwear to murder. Now, this is the frame that they are adhering to. And you are expecting that in the reduced personnel uh, staff that they have, they would be able to uh, be uh, friendly and respond and investigate and collect evidence and 
very, very good evidence so that they can be clinched in the court of law. Now, this becomes very, very uh, difficult. So the conception here is that forensic evidence is very important, but it has to adhere to all the ethics that can be uh, collated together. And here I would like to share the case of uh, Abdul Wahid Sheikh. He has written a book, uh, Beguna Kadi. And he has very, very clearly elucidated what happened to him during the uh, narco analysis test and how the evidence was tampered with and how he underwent torture right from, pinch, uh, you know, his ears being pinched by a certain tool, his nails being uh, uh, attempted to being pulled out. He has very clearly documented it. He has brought up the fact that um, there was no hearing for him. There was no space where he could because he was under uh, uh, organized crime and he was under, he was a terror suspect. So obviously his access to rights was uh, way more limited than the others. And the fact that he withstood all of that, he was uh, finally absolved of all the issues that were uh, he was blamed for. And he brought it out very, very clearly that in a given situation under narco analysis, how uh, leading questions are asked, how that leading question then gets edited out and then when the final footage is uh, portrayed or played out, it gives a completely different story. So the very fact that we uh, or the justice system is aligning to these uh, forensic evidentiary tools to rule out torture and to expedite justice, this narration and many others, but this is something that is very, very strong. It's very beautifully captured in various places. So as uh, professionals who are aligning and working with the criminal justice system, it's important to ensure the sanctity of these mechanisms, the sanctity of ethical codes, as well as the sanctity of the rights of the accused so that justice to the victims can be uh, doled out and be given out as a matter of right. So uh, that is all that I have to say because human rights is a huge concept in forensic evidence as well. And there is this whole understanding that technology and science will be able to take care of everything. We have to understand that technology and science is being um, prepared by humans. It is being executed by humans. So there is a whole lot of chance of bias and there is a whole lot of chance of the fact that it can be misused. And if these two are not taken care of, the forensic evidence then starts losing out in terms of its value, both as evidence as well as a tool to deliver justice. So if there is a mechanism to rule out all of this, we are definitely hoping that the Indian justice system can be revamped and can be um, improved. However, uh, if it does not happen, then we will be constantly going to the court of law and fighting for rights of both the victims and the offenders. So this was my rushed presentation because my time is also over. Any questions, I'll be ready to take it.